Hello everyone. Welcome to another capsule of international relations for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today we will discuss the recent meeting of the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas which was held in Indore recently 8th to 10th January. Why I'm why I'm discussing is because diaspora matters are part of the syllabus for the civil service examination. It occupies an important part of the international relations section of the general paper. We need to know the current situation in the Indian diaspora. We should know the relationship between the government and these various agencies and organizations. And the nature of the diaspora itself, why it is so diverse, it is all over the world. Different sections of the diaspora have different demands for the Indian government. And there are several complex issues relating to India's relationship with Indian diaspora. Uh, but the important thing is that ever since Mr. Narendra Modi took over as Prime Minister, he has been treating the welfare of the diaspora as one of the key aspects of his foreign policy apart from the neighborhood, powerful nations, and uh, others he has included, you know, economy, defense security, neighborhood, and then the diaspora. He has been including this as a major aspect of India's foreign policy. And wherever he goes, he has been meeting them and also promoting active involvement of the diaspora in India's economic development. Therefore, it's, an, it's important for you to uh, recall some of the aspects of the relationship between India and the diaspora and how it is growing and how the diaspora itself is growing and assuming great importance in international affairs. So, uh, the practice of holding uh, Pravasi Bharati or Divas, not just one day, but two or three days, I started in 2003, uh, following a report of a high-level group of the Ministry of External Affairs, we studied all the aspects of the overseas Indians and submitted a report to Prime Minister Vajpayee. And one of the recommendations was that to have an annual conference of, representative of the representatives of the diaspora in Delhi in order to bring them closer to the government. Of course, Indians do come and go, but there was no real interaction at the government level. And this was introduced at that time. And ever since, many conferences have been held. This is, of course, the 17th main Pravasi Bharati Adiva celebrations. It was held in Delhi initially, several years, and then it started moving around to other cities. And this year, it was held in Indore, as you know. There have also been regional conferences of the Pravasi Divas in other parts of the world. Several of them are held in the US, in Canada, in Singapore, and others. So this has become an established institution where the government of India tries to understand the problems of the uh, Indians, overseas Indians. There was a Ministry of Overseas Indians for some time, but now it has been merged with the Ministry of External Affairs. And um, uh, the activities relating to the Indian diaspora have increased over the years. And the importance that we attach to them and they attach to India has also uh, increased in recent years. So the purpose of the Pravasi Bharati Divas every year in January is to bring the Pravasis or the overseas Indians close to India and provide them opportunities to interact, invest, and uh, uh, visit India, and to take care of their concerns. These were never taken into confidence, but taken uh, seriously in the past. In fact, in, when India became independent, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Nehru's view was that the Indians who migrate to other countries, particularly if they become citizens of those countries, their allegiance should be to the countries of their adoption, first allegiance. So he did not really expect the Indian communities abroad 
to be of particular assistance to India. So he said that you should owe your allegiance to country of your adoption. And uh, India, of course, will continue to remain aware and conscious of your welfare and interests. So that was the formula he gave to the parliament, how we should develop our relations with the diaspora. It is unlike the Chinese who uh, treated their diaspora abroad as citizens of their own country, and they demanded much from the diaspora in the initial stages. It was Mr. Rajiv Gandhi who uh, started the idea of using talented Indians abroad to come to India and help India in its development. Sampitroda is a well-known case where he, he gave up his very uh, you know, uh, prosperous uh, work in the United States, came to India and changed the face of Indian telecommunication system. There have been others, and he was generally expecting Indians abroad come, to come to India and provide technology, give assistance to the government, and even invest in India. So this priority changed the situation, and all embassies were asked to take special interest in the communities in those countries. Some countries are very significant, like in the United States, in the UK, in South Africa, many other countries, and uh, some, of course, smaller, but equally influential, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi decided that uh, uh, we will go to the rescue of Indians if Indians are in trouble. And Indians have been in trouble on many occasions when military coups and other disturbances take place. Indian community has suffered because the uh, largest was in Burma, but uh, one million Indians were thrown out with just the clothes they were wearing without anything to look after themselves. And then government of India merely accommodated them in some rehabilitation project. We did not take up this matter with the government of Burma or do any protest about the kind of treatment meted out to the Indian community. That's old story. That is 1962. But the most uh, obvious intervention by India in the matters relating to uh, Indian diaspora was at the time of the Fiji military coup, where I happened to be the Indian High Commissioner. And I had the direct uh, knowledge of the development of Indian policy towards Fiji. Because generally, we would have simply given visa to any Fiji Indian to come back to India and settle here and nothing more. But Mr. Rajiv Gandhi took a very proactive position. He did not recognize the military regime in Fiji, even though I continued as ambassador. He imposed trade sanctions against Fiji. He raised the issue of human rights in, um, in the United Nations. Uh, politically, as well as on the human rights situation. And he even persuaded the Commonwealth to expel Fiji from the Commonwealth on the ground that they were practicing apartheid against the Indians. So this was a dramatic change in our situation. And now the policy is that India will stand by Indians anywhere in the world and try to resolve their issues and not just hands off uh, kind of approach. Uh, mercifully, not many other issues have come up since then, but the cooperation between Indian diaspora and the government of India has been strengthened, and uh, generally, Indians are happy that uh, many of their problems are being solved. And in return, they are using their clout in different parts of the world in order to influence decision-making. And this was particularly significant in the United States when there were serious problems between India and the United States in 1998 when we uh, experimented, we exploded five bombs and declared ourselves a nuclear weapon state. Months together, there was no communication with the United States. They were very angry. President Clinton wanted to come down like a ton of bricks on the government of India. All this happened. And it was after two years of negotiations and discussions, etc. We resolved that problem and uh, India and the United States came to an understanding. But that was a very difficult period where when we needed the support of the very influential Indian community 
in the United States. Again, I was there at that time, and we were very much engaged in converting and <coughs> telling our Indians to work hard in order to make our issues understood in the American public. Because earlier, like the time of uh, emergency, etc., it was the Indian community which opposed the government of India more than the others. And because they felt that India was abandoning democracy, etc., etc. So after those days were over, when India tested the nuclear weapons, the, the, the wind started blowing differently. So the Indians felt proud of India's achievements. And they felt that the United States was being unduly critical of India. And therefore, they started their lobbying work for India in a very extensive manner. Of course, by the time we had set up an Indian uh, lobby within the U.S. Congress and the Senate, what is called the India Caucus, and there are a number of uh, senators and congressmen who were autom automatically support the Indian position in the American legislature. And that was a very strong point for us. And finally, the understanding between the Indian and the United States on this issue came up, became evident uh, two years after when we signed the nuclear deal. And during that period also, the Indians in the United States played a big role. And similarly, in other places, not to that extent, UK also and many other countries where Indians are in sizable numbers, the opinion became very important. And Prime Minister Modi's visits, uh, he gave prime importance to Indians, people of Indian origin, regardless of their citizenship today, as part of India. So this development took place uh, really after uh, the uh, Pravasi Divas was uh, started. And the date of the Pravasi Divas was uh, decided on the basis of the day uh, Mahatma Gandhi returned to India from South Africa. That was the 9th of January. Uh, 9th of January, he returned to uh, India and, of course, led the freedom movement, as we all know. So that is the uh, situation. And uh, uh, so 9th, 10th, and 11th, these were the three days which were set apart for the uh, Pravasi Divas. And uh, large numbers of Indians uh, started coming at their own expense to participate in the... But the local hospitality was provided by us. All the provisions were made for them to meet. The chief ministers went to these sessions. Mr. Modi himself, it was his first appearance as a chief minister of Gujarat on the international scene was when he came to these Pavasi Divas and exhorted Indians abroad to come and invest in Gujarat because he was the chief minister of Gujarat at that time. He also developed a good relationship with uh, those who came to these conferences. So over the years, this have become an important event in the calendars of both the government of India and the Indian diaspora. And uh, a lot has been achieved. Many of the consular problems and other problems that the Indians had were uh, sorted out. As I said, these are problems who are very different. There are very many rich Indians who really do not need any help from us. There are very many poor Indians, particularly Indian nationals in the Gulf, etc., who, who demand attention from us and who need support from us in dealing with those governments. So it's a diverse, some kind of communities are not bothered about India. Other communities are dependent on India. And their status is different. Some of them are citizens of those countries. Some are still Indian nationals. The question of voting takes place. The question of their properties in India being protected. All these were met to a certain extent. I'm not saying that all problems were resolved. But every time we have these meetings, uh, we tackle these. Experts are invited. The concerned officials are given. And then some support, legal support to these people. Etc. So the, it has completely transformed India's relations with diaspora, not just a group of Indians we have sympathy for or love for, but as actual partners in very many things. And India has gained very much in terms of technology, in terms of money, and uh, in terms of the uh, in willingness of many of those, uh, those Indians to return to India, at least for short periods of time, to participate in the development. So, and so this, this year's meeting was a continuation. Of course, last, last time 
uh, it was uh, because of the pandemic it was held online but this time indore which is a very important city came to life as it were and all these people came there a lot of indians also participated and generally it was a it was a great success so the purpose is to strengthen the <clears throat> engagement of the overseas indian community and reconnect with their roots whether it is cultural programs where discussion on meetings investment people bankers everybody huddles around whenever there is a pravasi bharat divas is celebrated and our ministers prime minister goes there foreign minister goes there president herself was there to give what are called the pravasi samman pravasi awards for distinguished uh, indians abroad that's also become a major symbol of the recognition that government of india offers to our people abroad whether they are indian nationals or not that treated as indians and also simultaneously as you all know the indians have also become important in international politics like uh, the recent appointment of or election of the prime minister of uk for the first time a brown politician uh, who is characterized as a worshipper of the cow has become the the prime minister of uk and next door in ireland also there is a, a prime minister of indian origin and someone was saying that the big issues relating to brexit which has to be handled between uk and ireland it is two indians who are going to do the negotiations <laughs> of course not to speak of the vice president in the uh, united states and very many others large number in the united states they were already at the head of many corporate bodies you know the all the names of indians who went from here after having been educated in india some of them from iits but some of them from ordinary schools in india who went to the united states and made big name and uh, as many as something like 46 big corporations uh, like pepsi cola so many others not to speak of the uh, of the new media the social media it's all dominated by indian technicians and bureaucrats and thinkers and that is now gradually spreading on to the government so it's not only in the te- in technology uh, but as level of prime ministers or foreign ministers or various other positions and so so on the one hand there is a growth of indian diaspora getting closer and closer to the government of india and at the same time indians are doing well with the kind of confidence that they have got that they have the support of india they are doing more and more and the indian qualities like respect to the elders respect for the hierarchy these are things which do not exist in many other countries and these youngsters even after they reach the united states and maintain some of these qualities and that probably contributed to their growth in the corporate world and now from there to uh, the political field also now in the united states there are several congressmen um, elected congressmen and uh, the number is growing and even though indians are only a 1% of the of the population and they are a decisive factor in political matters and people cultivate the indians and uh, uh, prime minister modi as well as uh, president trump made use of this uh, presence of these people that's why we had uh, uh, you know big gatherings in the us and india um, which strengthens this uh, this culture so looking at the pravasi bharatiya divas itself um, the the first meeting was uh, conducted by the foreign minister it was uh, dedicated to the young people the young people in the diaspora who is getting more and more concerned and engaged with the country's concern and with india so mr jay shankar made the point that uh, it is uh, important that the youngsters young indians must get more and more involved and uh, connect with india and uh, the inaugural session was uh, handled by him in emphasizing the fact that uh, the young indians must get more and more involved 
and the theme of the of the PBD as it calls so Vasi Bharati Divas was itself a diaspora reliable partner for progress in the Amrit Kal. As you know, this period is referred to by our government as the Amrit Kal. That is a time leading to the to the uh, to the growth of Indian Indian development, economic development. So at the moment, there are about 36 million people of Indian origin in the world. That is the calculations, not be a um, attack figure, because many of them, the Indians abroad, are not even registered with us, and it's very difficult to get exact accounts. But uh, it's believed that it's about 36 million, which is a it's a large, large number. So, Mr. Vajpayee said in 2017 that uh, this is a relationship of blood, not passports. Kuhn, he said, not passports. So this relationship it's, you know, goes beyond what the color of their passports, but what matters is the culture that they carry with them. So, they could be in any country, hold any passports, but uh, is here exposure to Indian culture. And that is something which we have accomplished, so more and more young Indians are coming to India, uh, if not for anything else, to trace their roots. And uh, even the centers of faith, you know, wherever you go, whichever country you go, you find Hindu temples and other uh, Sikh Gurudwaras, etc. So even the faith is, uh, is growing. And uh, India has the largest diaspora in the world. And also the most talented diaspora. Well, not only rich, but also cultured, educated, etc. So, uh, we believe that uh, the Indian diaspora is the only empire on which the sun never sets. The British used to say that the British empire sun never sets. But uh, if you look at the world altogether, you will find that when it is dark in one part of the world, it is light on the other. And both sides, Indians are working. You know, when um, in Fiji, when the farmers go to to work in the morning, they are the earliest, and therefore Indians will be sleeping. But by the time they come back from work, you will see that in California, Indians are driving towards their work. So they never, the community as a whole never sleeps. They're always working for themselves and also for the, for the country. And um, a lot of issues were dealt with. And uh, in uh, indoor, and uh, of course there are there are several issues yet to be resolved for which governments the government has been working with them, and there is increasing confidence in um, the solutions. But uh, I would not say everything is resolved. There are difficulties about uh, investments in India. There are people who come to the uh, PVD and complain about the amounts of money they lost in one part of the state or the other, the humiliation they had to face at the uh, customs and the airport, and people not recognizing the uh, overseas Indian certification that we give to prove their, they still want, because there is a PIO card, that's a person of Indian origin card, which was given uh, to identify them as Indians. And then it was strengthened to make it overseas Indian citizens of it, citizens of India, another higher level. But still, people are not satisfied because they want dual nationality. So dual nationality exists only in some countries of the world, like yeah. United States or UK or Israel. Not all developing countries, hardly any does that. Because of our own history and our own system, because if you talk about Indian origin people, you know, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all these get, get mixed up. And so giving um, dual citizenship is not only against the constitutional requirement of India, because we believe that the loyalty of Indians should not be divided. You can't have two passports. Passports are more than mere uh, symbols. Uh, you get attached to your passport, and so your loyalty can be divided. And also the practical problems of who is Indian, who can be given the passport, et cetera, et cetera. So this has not been uh, resolved, uh, but this overseas Indian uh, passport that uh, they are holding together with their foreign passports. 
has helped in many ways, though there have been uh, difficulties. So on the one hand, you have the Indians themselves growing in stature all around the world. On the other hand, India becoming more solicitous towards the Indians abroad and uh, giving them benefits of various kinds. And um, every time we hold a Pravasi Bharati, it's like this happened this time, there is greater understanding, there is greater involvement of the politi politicians of India in the affairs of this. And so they, they feel. And it's, of course, a photo opportunity. People get pictures with the Prime Minister and the President. And these awards are very well, highly valued by these Indians abroad, not only for their work abroad, but also for India and people who do humanitarian work, People do people who work with the less privileged communities. There was someone who was engaged in burying Indian dead bodies by himself. Uh, doing that kind of work was recognized. Not only millionaires, but others are also recognized in this whole process. So it's a very healthy growth of uh, Indian diaspora. And it has benefited them because they have more possibilities of representing their case to government of India and expect them to be problems to be resolved. And on the other hand, India has this rich resource of people abroad, particularly in democracies, where they are able to influence decision-making. As I mentioned, the caucus, India caucus in, um, in the Congress and the Senate. In Senate, it was actually headed by Hillary Clinton at one time. And they are automatically friends of India. And they operate, and we, the embassy operates through their friends, their Indian friends, to the congressmen and senators. And when an Indian friend tells, Indian doctor, for example, tells his client who is a congressman to join the Indian caucus, they do so. And then we educate them, we tell them what the issues are between India and the United States. And often they support India rather than the United States on issues like human rights, etc. I mean, I wouldn't say that this has solved all the problems, even now, Many Indians abroad feel that we are not doing enough for them and they are not satisfied with the progress that India is making, etc. This is very, very, very common. So uh, I would conclude by saying that uh, this uh, mutual understanding and uh, growth of uh, their influence in India and their influence abroad for the sake of India and the massive receptions that our Prime Minister gets wherever he goes, all these show its complete transformation in the relationship between India and the Indian diaspora. And I'm sure it must have been strengthened by the various documents issued, approved, decisions taken, interactions, etc. All these must have um, had another uh, impact. And um, you know, some states have also started this. Uh, um, Kerala, for example, has a Loka Kerala Sabha. Many people have been designated as Indian um, not necessarily Indian citizens, who's in, who Indians who automatically support Kerala in investment, etc. And they all come and they try to be try to be helpful. So this is a success story. India's relations with diaspora and started by several governments, and now these days all parties are unanimous on one thing: that we must take care of the welfare of the diaspora. Whatever change in government may take place. This will remain constant, as we have seen at the time of Rajiv Gandhi, and we have seen it at the time of uh, uh, Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, even more uh, under Mr. Modi. So it is something which uh, we can cherish, and I'm sure people who attended the uh, Indoor conference must have returned with satisfaction that uh, this uh, is mutually beneficial to both the government of India and the Indian support. Thank you. Well, the experience is the opposite. All these countries respect the way in which India is supporting their countries. It is not in conflict with their countries itself. Uh, you know, President Biden recently talked about the great revolution that Indian community has brought about. How it is, he said, from day to day, U.S. progress is being supported by the Indians. He mentioned specific names, etc. Maybe some criticism may be there. Why are you intervening in the inter internal affairs of other countries? 
that of course will always be there. But uh, as long as you exercise judgment and intervene only when the situation demands it, there will be no lowering of our prestige. And this is not, we are not the only ones who do it. The Chinese do it in a big way. And there are others who use their uh, nationals for this. And so it is not pressurizing as such. Maybe influencing, maybe uh, cultivating the local communities. Like President Prime Minister Modi said that every Indian must bring at least five non-Indians to India on a, as tourists. We should persuade them. Pick your five friends, five non-Indian friends, and send them to India on a tour. It's very easy to do. People want to travel. So you just have to give them the information, persuade them to come to India. I don't know the figures, but he had made this uh, exhortation to Indians. And I'm sure it must have worked. So there is really no conflict there. There may be an occasional tiff, like uh, when we wanted to raise money in the United States soon after the nuclear experiments. And Indians were willing to uh, invest. And uh, we were giving them a very high interest rate, 18% even at that time. And um, then there was some problem, because uh, people started asking, why only some people are allowed to contribute? Only Indian origin is not only allowed. Why not the others? So, so this kind of discriminatory charges have come. But these have all been dealt with, so no concern about that. Well, the, there is nothing to be compared between uh, the and Nicobar Islands and uh, uh, foreign countries, because and when the cover is uh, certainly part of India. And whatever development we do is our own business, our own concern. In fact, at one time, uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi planned to develop Andaman Nicobar Islands in a very big way to invite uh, foreign investment. That program, I think, is still there. So what we do for Andaman Nicobar Islands need not be confused with what we do for our Indian support. These are two different matters. They are our own citizens, like our citizens in the, in the Gulf, etc. We take even a more active interest. But those who have become other citizens of other countries, we don't. But certainly parts of India, lack of development is not to be confused with uh, the work that is being done for the last forum. Maybe you are reading something which appears in my... Wikipedia entry, which I did not write. It talks about first class and third class and all that. It's already wrong. I had told them to correct it, but they have not been able to correct it. Because I cannot correct it myself. Somebody else has to correct it. Maybe you are referring to that. I don't know. But there are others, there is no such thing as first class secretary and third class secretary. There are said first secretaries and third secretaries and so on. And when you join the foreign service, you start as a third secretary and you go up the ladder. Uh, but somebody made a mistake and entered it as uh, different classes. So it has to be corrected, but I'm still trying to correct it. Yeah, it is difficult because they are in, in another country, different laws, different regulations, etc. So it has to be gradual persuasion of these countries to understand the problems of Indians and try to resolve them. Because they often see this as a contract. You know, you are paid for what you are doing. And uh, all other, um, you know, expressions, etc. Are, are all restricted. And uh, therefore, Indians have been very responsible. They don't try to, they may fiddle with Indian politics, but they never try to interfere in the politics of those countries. They have been very good about that. And that is what we encourage. That they are there for a specific job to return nothing. But something which is relating to their own livelihood and lives and living conditions, etc. Our embassies take a great interest. In fact, our embassies in the Gulf do more welfare work. Now, our economic work and political work is also increased in the Gulf. But most of these missions originally started as welfare offices. It continues to do that. Hundreds of people go to the embassy every day with various problems. And uh, all those problems cannot be solved by the embassies. They have to go each time to the foreign office and try to figure out what's happening. But everybody agrees that, the, including the governments of these countries, believe that the uh, the India's uh, intervention in these cases have been very helpful because they'll be looking for an Indian and where he is, what he is. They don't know what can, what part of India 
All those problems have been resolved because Indian embassy is completely in touch with these authorities. So there are some uh, laws which are very rigid in some of these countries. And sometimes people are punished and uh, that it cannot be helped because the law, law will take its own course. But wherever there are possibilities of uh, explaining their case and trying to get their release, etc., we have been trying and we have been succeeding also. So it's a mixed story. We can't say everything is successful. But um, it is legitimate activity and it is recognized as such and these governments welcome the help that we give. Because after all, everybody's interest is to see that those workers or others have a good life and we don't, nobody wants them to suffer. So it is in that process that the, both the countries are helping out each other. One thing that has uh, become very clear after the pandemic is that uh, the work from home idea is gaining ground because people are finding it very advantageous in many ways. It reduces travel, it reduces expenditure, it reduces uh, broken um, homes. All this uh, has uh, shown that there are benefits. But at the same time, many people like to travel rather than stay at home. Because why do people go abroad? Not simply to earn money, but also to have the cultural experience of those countries on the one hand. And on the other, get their benefits. So you become permanent uh, residents or you become citizens and so on. So that will also reduce. I think visas from developed countries will reduce because they will say there is no need for you to come to the United States. You can work from home. And that's not entirely satisfactory from our point of view. So the migration will probably reduce as a result of the work from home and online education. Like, for example, they may say, why do you need a visa to come to the U.S. to study? We will give you the material in India. So this may strengthen. As of now, the, it has not reduced. Even after the pandemic, it has only increased the presence of Indians abroad. They, of course, all of them came away worried about what might happen to them or their families. But most of them have returned. So this will continue. It will be a, a kind of a dual arrangement and a hybrid, as we call it. So people work from home and also people go to the offices and get the benefit of both. Thank you.